Jesse for bringing Teresa. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to read to you some of our emails we get from around the country and around the world. These are people that write to us since we live stream every Sunday afternoon at 1 o'clock Central Standard Time. And that is... Uh, we live stream all over the world, and we have people write to us with all kinds of questions. And uh, they write to us from Hawaii and from Australia and from Germany and from France and all over Africa and a uh, little bit of everywhere. And we're on TV all over the country, so they write to us from America, want to know these questions. Uh, and we 
we try to answer them the best we can. I got an email from Bob, no address given. Send us your address, we'll send you some emails. Send you some free DVDs. Dear Jim, trust you and Mary are keeping well. I heard one of your sermons explain from the original Greek the connection between fornication and worship. Can you give me the message number? I don't know what the message number is. You've got to give it to me. And please explain that again. When the Bible says that Babylon was the mother of harlots, the word harlot is the word pornea, P-O-R-N-E-I-A. And the word pornea actually means idolatry. Idolatry. Idolatry is the Greek word E-I-D-O-L-O-L-A-T-R-E-I-A. And it means it comes from ido, meaning to see, and latruo, L-A-T-R-E-U-O, meaning to serve what you see, what you put into your eyes and your ears. Israel was said to have gone after their lovers when they went after idolatry. You can look at that, just to give you one good example, uh, in, in Haggai, the second chapter, the Bible talks about Israel going after their lovers, which is their idols. It was Baal in the grove and so forth. And the Bible says because they committed this fornication, God gave them a bill of divorce. Bill of divorce. Jesus divorced his wife. Well, the preachers like that are not. Bill of divorce. And you can find that in Jeremiah, the third chapter. The third chapter of Jeremiah. Read that. And... Uh, I hope that helps you, Bob. Give us a, <coughs> unless you give me a, a number of the DVD, I, that's the best I can answer it. Then uh, Mike in California writes, and he says, Jim is my pastor. Good, I'm glad to hear that. All that I've found in the church buildings has been the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And that's true. Lust is the word epithumia. E-P-I-T-H-U-M-I-A. It means to long for, to breathe hard, and to cover your life with breathing hard. I want her. I want that. I want him. I want that car. I want that house. That's what it is. And the lust of the flesh it's just those are the three things that Eve saw in the tree. She saw a tree that was good for food. It would fulfill the lust of her flesh. Is it pleasant to the eye? It would bring her to idolatry and the pride of life. And she would be, she would bask in her own conceits and be proud of herself. So I saw the pride of life tree every December, year after year. That's exactly what it is. Because they put the gifts under the tree. In the ancient world, they said the gift, the tree was the giver of all divine gifts to men. You get that out of the two Babylons. We cringed at self-worship. My family broke from this tradition for, for over almost 20 years now. Well, what gets me? You mean preachers cannot see in Christmas Christ? Mass. Christmas is Christ's Mass. It's the Mass of Roman Catholicism. Trying to explain to the church that Christmas is a pagan holiday, it's not hard to figure out. Christ's Mass is what it is. Look it up in any dictionary or any encyclopedia. It's a pagan holiday has led to defining our family as heretics. They're going to call you a heretic when you quit keeping what they call Jesus' birthday. It was the birthday of Mithra, the chief sun god of Rome. This term was spoken to the church and reaffirmed Sunday after Sunday, month after month. Not many seek truth anymore or even question lies. They don't. They don't care. 
They think, how can all these preachers be wrong? And you be right, Jim Bryan. I tell them, if they say, you don't think you're the only ones that's telling the truth. If I'm telling the truth, you better listen. That's all I have to say to you. Without Jim's teachings, I would feel completely alone. We all do. I don't believe that the world is turning away from Christianity. I believe that the world is redefining Christianity. That's true. They've redefined all the words of the Bible. Modern Christianity has become a friend of the world. That's true. They want to get along with everybody. The Baptists want to get along with the Catholics. They want to get along with the Church of Christ. <coughs> they want to get along <coughs> with, the, with everybody. They want to get along with the Mormons. They want to get along with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, they're hard to get along with because <laughs> they think everybody's going to hell but them. They're like the Church of Christ. Modern Christianity has become a friend of this world. Instead of being salt and light, the church has become altar calls, cookies, kind words, and sweet phrases, and let us all get along. That's right. It's, it's, this, uh, it's this modern uh, thing in the Roman Catholic Church, the tolerance doctrine. It's the political correctness. Everybody smiling at each other. Don't anybody correct anybody. The condition of modern Christianity is lukewarm and its salt has lost its savor. When I explain the teaching of Billy Graham to Christians, I quickly become pers persona non grata. I welcome, I become the unwelcome person. Me too. You're not any different than the rest of us. I become the unwelcome person who makes people feel uncomfortable. I once heard this phrase, and it rings true to me. If modern Christianity was poison, it wouldn't kill anybody. <laughs> like that. If it was medicine, it wouldn't cure anybody. It's not strong enough to kill or cure. It's just mumbo-jumbo, just mush. After Jim is called home, then what? Well, we're going to keep on playing. Our Mike's going to keep playing the, our DVDs from now on. As long as people will stay in touch and support the ministry. When I'm gone, they're going to keep playing these and sending out free DVDs. I'm very serious about this. Will there be anyone defining truth? I'll keep on doing it on the Internet. We've got over 40 2263 4, master DVDs. Nobody's going to learn all the information I've put on those over the last 34 years. Nobody's going to learn it all. The amount of information is phenomenal. I don't that's not a boast. I've just spent when I say I've been studying for 67 years, I don't mean I've studied two or three hours a week for 67 years. I went for about three or four decades where I was immersed in the Greek text. I mean, up to 30, 35 hours every week, just buried in it. It's not like you'll learn this all of a sudden. Pray for Jim's health and his calling. Beyond Jim's teachings, I don't see much light left in the churches. I don't either. I must admit that sometimes I don't agree with Jim all the time. But to rephrase Jim's admonition, it's better to be thought a fool than open one's mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> I hope you're saying that about yourself. And I don't want to move from being stupid towards being ignorant. Ignorant is unlearned. That's all it is. Stupid is forever. That is, that's the word ba'ar in the, ba'ar in the Hebrew. It means to have the understanding of a brute beast. It's the word brutish. Have the understanding of a brute beast that cannot learn. There's some animals that can't learn. You can't teach them. Some of them are so overwhelmingly big and large that you just can't teach them. 
Anyway, let me go on here. I sure don't want to move from being stupid towards being ignorant. First Thessalonians 5.21 calls us to be sure of all things. Well, not really. It doesn't say sure. It says prove all things. It doesn't mean you prove it your way. It's not what it means. It's the word dokimazo. Dokimazo. That's the word prove. D O K I M A Z O. It means to test by putting in the fire. If it can last the fire, it's the truth. We get the word dokimas, D O K I M A S. And when the alpha is front of dokimos, it negates the word and it means no fire. That's what's called reprobate is the word. Reprobate means no fire. We don't like the fire. Don't tell us those things that we have to put in the fire. When you prove it, you put it in the fiery trials of life. And if it lasts, it's the real thing. The trial of your faith is more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried by fire. So prove doesn't mean you prove it your way. That's not what it means. It means you don't want it to be reprobate or cast away. Paul said, if I don't bring my body into submission, I will become a castaway. There was a, a silver in the Old Testament. It was called reprobate silver. And when it was not put into the fire and burn out all the impurities, it was cast out in the street and trodden down under the feet of men. That's what this is talking about. It's not talking about you prove it your way. No. Put it in the fire and see if it lasts. Mike, love you guys. Mike in California. We love you, Mike. Keep writing to us. Then Robert Cresilius in Florida writes to us. He says, Hello, Pastor. First, thank you for your efforts. Day after day, you, you show the sheep how to be consistent and faithful. You are a true blessing and a real image of Christ we all aspire to be. Will you tell me what this means? All power is given. I'll give you that. Is this some change from the Old Testament? Or is it saying all power in the ruling class and the rule is with Jesus now? Matthew twenty-eight eighteen. Jesus, this is the great commission. Jesus came and spake unto his apostles, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Thank you, Robert Cresilius. That word power, there's two words that have been translated into the English power, P-O-W-R. They're not the same word. This is one of them. This is the word exousia. E-X-O-U-S-I-A. The other word is the word dunamis, D-U-N-A-M-I-S. Both of these are translated power. They're not the same thing. That's why you need to study your Greek text in a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. Dunamis, we'll get our word dynamite from that. The Bible says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the dunamis. The, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. This word that you're talking about is exousia. Exousia is a basic form of several words. It's a basic form from exista, E-X-E-S-T-I. And that's our word existent. Existent or to exist. And from that we get the word E-X-X-O-N in the Greek, exon. Uh, we used to have these service stations called exon, and they called, they had a big sign up there with the tiger. They just put a, put a tiger in your tank, put power in your tank. And from exon we get E-I-N-A-I. E-N-A -I. E means to cause, to cause to be 
or to cause to exist. When he said all power is given to me, he said all existence comes from me. Well, that's powerful right there. Thank you, Robert, for asking that question. Exousia is the word. It comes from the word exist. I keep telling you the word be is a being verb, and all the being verbs comes from the verb to be. Be, is, am, are, was, were, being, been, have, has, had, do, does, did, shall, will, should, would, may, might, must, can, could. Those are all the being verbs. I memorized those when I was a kid in about the sixth grade, and I never forgot them. Our teacher told us to memorize them, so that's all the being verbs. Everyone shows the ability to be. You, not, you would not do anything. You would because you exist. Am is because you exist. All of it has to do with to be. All right, now... Thank you, Robert. We appreciate it. Love you, brother. Randy Howard in Illinois writes to us and says, Dear Pastor and Teacher Jim, a quick email to say thank you for your teachings. While I struggle with my situation every day, and while a lot of Bible is hard to stomach, as with all truth and reality, I find a great peace in the Bible in your teachings. Definition will put you at peace. Because preachers are saying things that are not true. The Baptist preachers are not telling the truth. They're telling you to accept Christ, and you can't do that when you're dead in sin. They're telling you to pray a sinner's prayer. You can't do that when you're dead. You can't call on a God you don't believe in. And your teachings and videos you provide. What I deserve to be in the lake of fire. Well, I'm glad you feel that way because everybody that's a true believer believes that. I am unsure if I will be in heaven or not. Well, that's okay for you to be unsure. You cannot be sure. When the Bible says, make your calling and election sure, he says that in Second Peter Right after he says, add seven things to your faith. Faith has to increase. Add seven things. And he names them. He starts off, he says, add virtue, which is maturity. How long does it take you to become mature in truth? 50, 60, 70 years. Long time. I used to worry about whether I saved or not when I was young because my father's messages said, if you don't know and you're not absolutely positively sure, I'm going to talk about that during the message. It is not up to me that it is up to God. That's exactly right. See, people, preachers who say you have to know you're saved, you can't know positively without a doubt. Nobody can. That's the reason you have faith in Christ to save you. You don't have, you never have faith in yourself to save you. That's the knowing. You you can't know. I have sent my tithe, and what I could help in those in need. I don't earn much, but I will continue to send my tithe and what I can support those in need each month. May God bless you in all that grace and truth. Uh, Randy Howard in Illinois. When the Bible says make your calling and election sure by adding these seven things to your faith, that's going to take years to add for your faith to increase. And then it turns right around and says make your calling and election sure by adding these seven things. That word sure doesn't mean positive. The word is be by us. Be by us means to stabilize by adding these seven things. You will stabilize it over the next 30, 40 years by adding these things to your faith. Read 2 Peter 1 and 5 on down through the following five or six verses, okay? Now, 
Rebecca Rogers in West Texas. Rebecca, we love you. She's going through so many difficult times. She lives in a little bitty house, and her brother was her caregiver, and he was taking care of her, and, and he died here last week, and she didn't have anybody to take care of her, and she's in a wheelchair, and she has very little way to get around. She's out in Loop, Texas. That's not too far from Amarillo. If you live out there, uh, give Rebecca a call or something like that. She, She's just really in a struggle. She writes us this letter, Hi, Brother Jim and Sister Mary and family. I really miss my brother David, and that's the one that passed away, who has gone to be with God. She said they would watch the DVDs, and he'd stop the DVD and explain something to her that she didn't understand. So he was a believer. I'm trying to get used to being alone. The, the county paid for his cremation. There is no service. I've been busy cleaning and throwing away David's clothes and accidentally got some of my clothes. My tiny house is not anywhere near ready because we have no funds for supplies. So I am stuck in a house that I can't get in or out of, and I can't turn on or off lights because they're on the ceiling and I can't reach them. She's in a wheelchair. I still listen to you all the time. This Alethea truth brings me peace. I love the way you teach. Thank you for everything you do. You're doing for me. We send her two hundred dollars a month because she's having a hard time. I can look back at my life and see what God has done for me in my life. God has always provided for me, and I see that now. Thank you for teaching me what prayer means. It means to bow to God's will. Now I can tell God. Thy will be done. I love you all. Agape and Phileo. Rebecca Rogers out in Loop, Texas. We love you, Rebecca. I wish you were nearby. We could help you. We could do a lot more to help you. We love you, Rebecca. Keep writing to us. Then Connie in Lebanon, Tennessee, out here about 30 miles from here. She writes to us, Dear Church, Still looking for housing, she has nowhere to live. There are so many homeless and disabled here. God's will is being done. I'm so grateful to you all for everything you do for the sheep. Agape and Phileo, Connie and Lebanon. We also send her a couple hundred dollars a month, every month. We love you, Connie. We, I'm not saying that in a boast. That is our obligation. Then Thomas in Canada my name is Thomas, and I'm an Eskimo ministering to Inuit people for the past 30-plus years. I've just recently stumbled on your teaching ministry. I'm 71 years old. I believe in predestination, too. I've watched several videos you have on the Internet. I am wanting to collect resource material, particularly Greek meanings of English words. Well, you need a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. It's got every word in the Bible listed alphabetically in the English. When you open it up to a word, it'll have it'll have numbers to the right of the verse, and if it's an Old Testament word, you look that number up in the Hebrew dictionary in the back. It'll give you the definition, how it's spelled, and this will be a start for you. If it's in the Old Testament, it'll be in the Hebrew dictionary in the back, the Greek dictionary in the New Testament. Call me and we'll talk about it. All the material I'm using is from the local metal dump. I will send, I will set up a podcast would very much appreciate what you you can send by mail. Thank you, Thomas in Canada. We love you, Thomas. We know you're struggling with things. Then 
Anthony Vega in New York writes to us. Hello, Jim. It's Anthony again. So I was telling my brother, Junior Vasquez, who has been listening to Charles Stanley for 25 years, that Charles Stanley is not a great preacher. He was a terrible preacher. Didn't believe in predestination. Didn't believe in the sovereignty of God. Said he did, but he didn't. Because I've heard him say so. That I don't consider him a great Bible teacher, preacher or teacher. He believes Charles Stanley is one of the giants in the Christian faith. Well, I don't know what he calls a giant. That's a bully in the Bible. He tells me that he has been listening to Dr. Charles Stanley for 25 years. If he's interested in the Greek words, Charles Stanley doesn't give you those. And he never heard him say anything wrong with his preaching. He never investigated his preaching. So I wanted to ask you, do you believe Charles Stanley is great sound doctrine? No, absolutely not. The Southern Baptists do not believe in the sovereignty of God. They celebrate Christmas and Easter and all those pagan holidays. They dip people in water and baptize does not mean to immerse in water or to sprinkle with water. And he believed in all that. Charles Stanley, to be blunt, he was a liar. He was a typical Baptist preacher. Baptist preachers lie. They preach, accept Christ as your personal Savior. And the Bible says a man who's dead in his sin cannot accept anything spiritual. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. Natural suki gods means the physical man. He preached everything wrong. He preached a Baptist doctrine. The Bab My father was a Baptist preacher. He preached the same things Charles Stanley preached. And I quit believing my father a long time ago. Anthony Vega in New York. No, I don't believe in him at all. Never have believed in him. And then Clarice Padley in South Africa wanted to send you some pictures, lots of love. This is their pictures. It seems like they only got pretty women in South Africa. <laughs> this is her and her husband here. Pretty girl. And then this is her in the middle. And her sisters. Her mom. I guess that's her mother and her sister. They're very pretty. You guys are really good-looking girls. And uh, then she's got... This is Franz and Estelle Vandenberg here. I, I don't know if they're kin to them, but they, all the pictures came at once. And this is the girls. Gosh, they're all pretty. We need that many pretty girls here because we've got a lot of single guys here. But that's, uh, I guess that's Clarice here, I guess, or her. I can't tell. They're all pretty. I can't tell which one is which. Well, this is them. We love you guys. Keep on writing to us. We need these pictures so we can, let me put this back on the, if y'all want to come up and look at these, you can after church. But they're in South Africa. Clarice, you are a very pretty girl and got a nice looking husband. That's good. Call you girls. I mean, anybody under 50 is a girl to me. <laughs> I'm 84. And it's okay if I call girls pretty now with my wife. Don't care because um, I'm too old to chase them or catch them. If I catch them, I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> All right. Now, I got several other emails, but I got a couple letters. Let me read to you. I got a card from Robin Peters down in Amarillo, Texas. We send her 
300. I'm telling you what we send them. Maybe you want to be a part of it. Grace and Truth Ministries sends her $300 a month. She's got a leukemia. Her leukemia bill runs 15000 a month. Her insurance pays for that. We send her an extra 300 every month so that she can somehow subsidize. She only draws $1,000 a month, Social Security. And her insurance, her Social Security pays for the, for the, uh, for her medication. And uh, but she's after she pays five hundred a month rent and another hundred and sixty or seventy a month utilities. I mean she hasn't got anything left, so we help her every month. And she writes to us and she sent this card that says to all of you the warmest warmest thanks, dearest Pastor Jim, Mary, and family. The heart remembers kind deeds and thoughtfulness. My heart remembers special people like all of you. Thank you so much. We love and are grateful for each of you, Agape and Phileo, Whale and Robin. Then she sent this letter. She writes this letter, Shalom, family. For the Lord has overcome the world for us. We thank you, Pastor Jim for being a beacon of light for the lost and hurting sheep. The Lord left the 99 to find and guide us into all righteousness. May the Lord give you the strength needed during your healing. I love you, Pastor Jim, and I thank the Lord for you being in our life. God bless you. I never believed I could be saved or even that the Lord would want to save me, a wretched sinner. I trust him for daily guidance and understanding and always seeking for his comfort. We are lost without the Lord, for the word is living and active within us. You are a blessing to me, a kind man, and I see that you care for us. You came into our life at the right time, well, and I needed strong meat. We live in the 21st century, and your teachings are as though we are in the first century. I cannot tell you just how much you and your ministry has changed my life. I know it's all the Lord's doing. It is His truth that abides in me. In each of us, the beautiful verse of John 15, 4, Abide me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I thank God for you and all, and all often take care and continue to keep on keeping on, as you say, Pastor Jim. Well and I, that's her son are so grateful to our family and Jesus for the love and help to visit you with all in Hendersonville. We thank you. God bless each one of you. Thank you, Pastor Jim, Mary, and staff for all you do for this body of Christ. We love you all well and Robin. Sincerely, your sister and brother in Christ Jesus. We love you guys very much. And anything we can do to help, we're going to do. All right. And then I had another another letter. It was just a card. Hi, Jim and Mary and congregation. I pray you are doing well. I love your ministry and teaching. Thank you for the DVDs. I've learned so much from you. Question. I know the Bible says angels are messengers. Can you light me on Acts 6.15 where Stephen, Stephen's face was like the face of an angel? Keep remembering angel angelos is just messenger. I don't know why they put angel in the Bible. They ought to put messenger every time it's mentioned. 
I know the Greeks as messenger, but what do they see? Even the Apostle Paul was there. Thanks again. Bless you and yours. Romans 8, 29, 30. Love it. George, the electrician from western Michigan. We love you, George. He saw an angel. He saw a messenger of God. We don't know. Maybe it was Michael or maybe it was Gabriel. Gabriel is God's messenger that carries messages to everyone. He's the one that revealed the 70 weeks to Daniel. He's the one that came to Mary <coughs> and, <coughs> and told her she's going to be with child of the Holy Ghost. Got one more letter. This is from Greg Cox. Greg is up in, he sends us offerings on a regular basis. He's up in Washington, D.C. Dear Pastor Jim, thank you for preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ like you do. No matter what DVD I watch, they all tie together in seamless harmony. I thank God for that. Pastor Jim, I am alone in Washington, D.C. I have no one to fellowship with who is abiding in these truths you preach. I understand I need fellowship with other believers. For a time, I befriended a believer who came out of the Pentecostal denomination. As I begin to share these truths, I have learned under grace and truth there was division between us. You're not going to be able to fellowship with Pentecostalism with their tongues and faith living. Relative to the Word of God on doctrine I am learning, I entered this fellowship because there was no unity between us concerning Bible doctrine. If it is possible, please share my name and email address with other believers under Grace and Truth Ministries who reside in D.C., Maryland. Area. When I think about believers under this ministry meeting together on Staten Island, New York, it gives me hope that the same would also happen in Washington, D.C. And he wants, this is Greg Cox, he wants some phone numbers and emails that he can email people because he feels alone. We have people writing to us from all over the country saying I'm alone and I need fellowship that'll be enough reading we've got people all over the world that write to us and I try to answer the questions as best I can and uh, I just I've studied a lot in my life and I've got a lot of answers for you just uh, keep writing to us we love all of you that write uh, I'm just, I believe everything I'm teaching. <coughs> we send people money throughout the world. Uh, we've got people all over that we send money to. I go to the bank. I went to the bank the other day. And I got about $2,500 in cashier's checks, counting these ladies I mentioned. And uh, some of them are $50, some are 100 Depends on their situation as to how much we send to them. Well, I can't send to everybody. But I only send to people who believe these truths and are hungry for the truth. And that we share with people that believe in all good things. And, uh, but we, I want to invite you, we've got a picnic coming up June the 3rd, and that'll be down here at, at Rockland Recreation Center. That's right here in, in center of Hendersonville. It's, if you go across the street, there's a McDonald's across the street from the church, Right behind McDonald's is a police station. And you can go over there and say, where's Rockland Recreation Center? They'll point off to the left and say, you see that road over there? That's Rockland Road. Go down there till it is a sign that says Rockland Recreation Center. It's easy to find. Everybody knows where it is. 
and uh, it's on the lake. We have a wonderful time together on the on the third. And for those of you that want the fellowship that live here in town or around here, we meet every Friday night at the Irvin House, uh, and uh, to package up DVDs. That's our production area to package DVDs and mail them out to people all over the world. And uh, if you'd like to be a part of it, just call us and we'll tell you how to get there. That will be enough. I guess I've done all the announcements, but uh, that'll be enough for right now. Just uh, pray for me. I'm going through some health problems. My back is still hurting. I'm going to therapy. I've got a dislocated disc, even when I'm preaching, but I'll preach anyway. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for truth above everything. Thank you for these definitions that help unravel the Word of God. And Lord, we pray that you'll give us strength to continue to do this work. Give me strength tonight to teach this message. And I pray that you'll cause the, the sheep to grow in this. And Lord, we'll give you praise for everything and fight our battles for us. We've got a lot of people that want to destroy this ministry. So fight our battles and we'll give you praise in Christ's name. Amen.
Now that's, that's the truth. I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries in Hendersonville, Tennessee. I am, uh, I, I just don't teach like anybody else. I go to the Greek text and find out the meaning of Greek words in the Bible. We have been, we have been sold a bill of goods by the historians and by the preachers, and people don't really care what's going on in America. They we have been lied to by all the preachers. I've got a I've got a title on the board. Baptist preachers, Pentecostal preachers, Church of Christ preachers, Catholic priests, and all other preachers in America are lying because they do not know the definition of the words in the Bible from the Greek text and the Hebrew text. They don't care what the definition is, is. We have been told things that are just not true, and I have never been so sick and tired of what's going on. In politics, I don't trust any politicians. No, none of them. I do not trust any of the preachers in the country. I listen to them. I have spent 67 years of my life studying the Bible, but I, the last 44, I've buried myself in the, studying the meaning of the Greek words in a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance and in an interlinear Bible. The interlinear Bible has the Greek on the top line, and right under it, it has the English. I don't even trust the English in an interlinear. I look up the Greek word, people say, don't you like certain versions of the Bible? I use a King James Bible, not because it is imperfect, because it's not, but it comes from the original Textus Receptus. That's what the interlinear Bible is. I'm really tired of the preachers and everything that's going on. I've got, I've got several books written by a man named Richard Shankman. Mr. Shankman was a graduate of Harvard. He was a brilliant man. He was a researcher for the Library of Congress. And he's written several books. And I've read to you some of the things out of his books. And it's just amazing what we've been sold a bill of goods that is not really true. Uh, we've been sold uh, like the old, old Western stories about the cowboys. Uh, probably the most famous Western gunfight was a place called Gunfight at the OK Corral in, in, uh, in, uh, out in Arizona in Tombstone. The Mr. Shingman says only five men were killed in Tombstone over a 15-year period. 
it wasn't black people getting killed every day. And the gunfight at OK Corral was not the way they presented it. It's just they wanted the they wanted fame and wanted to draw people in, so they made up these stories that are not true. Uh, Mr. Shingman has got a book here called Cherished Lies and Myths, Legends, Lies, and Cherished Myths of American History. He's got this one called Presidential Ambition. He takes a shot at all the presidents. Now, he's not some jack leg historian. He is a brilliant Harvard graduate, and he wasn't trying to shoot these guys down. He was just telling you the truth about them. They were just as greedy 200 years ago as they are now. And they lied and they cheated, including Washington, including Jefferson, including Ben Franklin. They were all liars and cheats. We even had one from from uh, Tennessee, uh, James Knox Polk. He lied constantly. And he's the guy that was behind the taking the American Indian land. He was behind that more than anybody else in what they called, uh, it was the doctrine of discovery. Later on, they had other names for it, uh, manifest destiny, steal the Indian land, and just, and we don't even know that that's what we did in America. People don't even know that. We stole the land of the Mexicans. We stole the Indian land. And we said the black man didn't have a soul during slave days. And we said that the Indians didn't have souls. That's why Columbus came over here and Ferdinand and Isabella said, you can go over there. The Pope has issued this, Pope Alexander the Sixth, who was Rodrigo Borgia, a murderer. He was a Pope that was a killer. We don't even know that, do we? People don't know that. Lucretia Borgia, one of the most infamous women in history, was his daughter. It's just insane what we've been sold here in America. The reason I don't like these preachers, they don't know what words mean. You got two words. Let me just give you some of them. You got two words for do. And they're not even the same word, do. You have the word ergon. Ergon. And you have the word poema, P-O-I-E-M-A. And both of them are translated do. Well, it's not even the same word. Ergon is the word that means to toil or work. Put your hands to the plow. Poema is a, it's it's translated do, but it's the work of God in his people. It's God's work. And poema comes from poeo, P-O-I-E-O, and it means something like a tapestry that God does in the life of all the believers, a tapestry or a mosaic. But most preachers don't even care about this. Mosaic. When the Bible says, I've heard my father quote Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and my father never quoted verse 10. I never heard him quote verse 10. 2, 8, and 9 says, For by grace you are saved through faith. Through is the word dia. Dia is like a channel or like a pathway through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. But see, the word gift, nobody knows what that means. The word is doron, D-O-R-O-N. And it means a sacrifice. It doesn't mean a gift wrapped up like a present with a bow on it like this. It, that's not what it is. It's not that. It's a sacrifice. Faith is the sacrifice that God puts in us 
and the ability to die to the flesh because faith is dying. See, most people don't know that faith is, it's not believing, it's not knowing that you're saved. That takes you to two other words. No, you got two words for no in the Bible. Two words for no. But let me finish up with this over here. You got this word. It's the gift of God, not of works, not of ergon, not of your toil or your labor. It's not something you do to merit faith. Faith is the gift of God that he puts it in our hearts, the desire to sacrifice and give our bodies a living sacrifice. Well, the word poeo comes in the following verses. Poeo means something with majesty in it, something like a mosaic. I've never heard a preacher say that. Have you? Never heard it in my life. We are his workmanship, P-O-I-E-M-A. Poema is a form of poeo. It means we are his, how does he work in us? He works with fire and trial and persecution, causing us to give up self or the flesh. Every person, I've had people want to correct me on this. They say, when you're saved, God gets rid of all your sin. No, he doesn't. No, he does not. Even Paul says he didn't. He doesn't get rid of all your sin. You have, When you're born again, you've got an inner man. You, you need to read Romans, the seventh chapter. Because he talks about that inner man and the outer man all through it. Then when he gets to verse 25, he says, With the outer man I serve the law of the flesh, I serve my sin, and with the inner man I serve the law of God. And you've got this wrestling match going. Your sin, the inner man cannot sin. That's what the Bible says in 1 John 3 and 9. 3 and 9. The man that's born of God, the inner man, cannot sin because he's born of God. His seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. The part of you that can't sin is only the inner man. You still live in the flesh. Does anybody have a problem with this flesh besides me? <laughs> besides everybody walking out of here? That is every human being. When somebody says, when the Nazarenes say, we don't sin, we just make mistakes. I knew a Nazarene lady down in, in Madison. She said, well, whenever I make a mistake, I said, that's called sin. When I make a mistake, it's not a mistake. It's this outer man that God has to deal with us in. And he deals with us. When, he, when the Bible says we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. There's two words for good. Good. You got, and I've never heard a preacher say there's two words and they're not the same word. They're not. You have the word agathos. And the word kalos. They're not the same word. How many times do I have to say that? Agathos means beneficial. And this word kalos, that's a godly word also. This agathos, that's the word. We're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Unto good ergon. You see, there's bad ergon and there's good ergon, but the good ergon has to be connected to poema. Poema means something done by God inside of us. So he says, we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. This word kalos is the word honest. Honest. 
unto him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. That's this word kalos there. But this word agathos, that's the same word in Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for agathos, for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. These are two different words, but they're both righteous words right there. How how can you read an English Bible and get the truth? You cannot fully get the truth out of an English Bible. You need to have a concordance, a strong, exhaustive concordance where you can look up the meaning of these words. Now, that's just a beginning. I've got a library in my home. I've got thousands of books in my library, and I've got many books on word studies and what they mean. I've got one set. It's a 10-volume set on Kittle's New Testament Greek words. It's a 10-volume. It's... There's two other words. Goodness gracious. There is love. <clears throat> How are you going to understand this without looking up the words? You have the word agathos. Not, excuse me. Agape. You have the word agape. And phileo. Phileo means to have affection. Or to like, I like my dog, I like God, I like to go fishing, I like to get drunk, I like drugs. I, you can like anything. <clears throat> That's just phileo. Agape is not phileo. And the sad thing is, all these preachers interchange these two words that have been translated to L-O-V-E. And you cannot interchange them. When you look at agape in Kittle's Dictionary, there's 34 pages just on the word agape in volume one of Kittle's New Testament Greek words. 34 pages. Do you think you need that? I think so. You know what's wrong? We have gotten, we're in the apostasy, we're in the great falling away. Definition doesn't mean anything to preachers. Nothing. You got two words for tongue. Two words that have been translated tongue, glossa. And dialectos. And they are not the same word. Glossa, we get our word glossary from that. There's no such thing as Pentecostal tongues. A glossary is a section of a book, words that are foreign to the average reader. This word glossa means a foreign language. Dialectos is our word dialect. That's what they said in Acts, the second chapter, how he were ever man and our own dialect wherein we were born. They're two different words and they're not the same word. What are you going to do about it? People, you're going to do anything? Preachers don't know. They don't even care. You got all this throughout the scriptures. Then you, we, are, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, to good ergon, but not of our own earthly ergon, not, on, not of the works of the flesh. Ergon has to be connected to poema to be righteous. So it's God in us. You've got I've got so many, I've got all these words that I've been studying through the years. Mister, I've told you before, G. Gresham Machen, who wrote a book, wrote this book. He was a professor in seminaries, and he wrote this book, New Testament Greek for Beginners. He, he was one of the most famous Greek scholars that ever lived in America. His This book, New Testament Greek for Beginners, was used in most of the seminaries across America for 50 years. 
And he said in a book that he wrote, Faith, what is faith? He said, you want to incense a man that thinks he knows everything? Ask him what a word means. He'll get mad and first. What do you mean? What does it mean? Everybody knows what that means. Oh, you don't know what tongue means. You don't know what faith means. And he, he'll tell you all about some of these things in his book. I'm just sick of the preachers. And then it says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, before ordained, that we should walk in these good works that he's performing in us. Before ordained, pro, E T O I M A Z O. This proetor mazo proves predestination. Proetor mazo comes from pro, meaning before, before, and hetoimas, H E T O I M A S. Hetoimas means to fit up. Pro, before, in advance. He has fitted us up from the foundation of the world since he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He's fitted up as us up in advance. Now let me give you some more of these. The Bible says in John 3, 21, He that doeth truth cometh to the light. If it has to do with God working inside of us, it's got to be. It is, has to be preceded by poema. If it's ergon, it's got to be preceded by poema in order to be the right kind of ergon. When the Bible says, he that doeth truth comes to light, the word doeth there is poema. Does it matter does it matter whether it's poema or ergon? Yes. Unless it's preceded by poema, where God is doing it in us. And how is he doing it? Putting us through fire, trials, persecution, getting rid of self, me. Getting rid of I. I is the word E. G O. That's the outer man. It's the word ego or ego is the way it's pronounced, but it's the same thing as ego in the Greek. He that doeth truth cometh to the light. Then he says over there in Mark three thirty five, when Jesus was in a house and they came into the house and said, Your brothers and sisters are outside. And your mother's out there wanting to talk to you. And he said, who is my brother and my sisters and my mother? He says, is it whosoever shall do the will of the Father? What do you think that word do is there? If you took a wild guess, which, one, which word do you think it is? It is the word poema. It can't be the word ergon. Not unless it's preceded by poema. If it's ergon, then it's God doing it in us. <clears throat> Does it matter? Yeah, it matters. It matters what words mean, Mr. Mr. The Greek teacher that I was talking about here, Mr. Machen, said you want to incense a man? Just ask him what a word means. He'll get mad at you. Uh, Randy LeBlanc is sending me a book by one of the old writers, uh, one of the Puritan writers, and he says he's saying in the book nobody knows what words mean. And he's a Puritan writer. People don't care what words mean. The preachers don't care. That's why the Baptists and the Pentecostals, the Pentecostals don't care that there's two words for tongue. One is gloss and the other word is dialect. 
The Baptist preachers don't care that you cannot accept Christ as your personal Savior. They'll, they'll give invitation hymns that last for an hour and a half and say all you have to do is walk down the aisle and accept Christ. And the Bible says when you're dead in sin, you cannot receive. Oh, there we go again. Another two words, receive. See, there's two words for receive that are common words. There's the word decomai. And there's the word lambano. Now let me help straighten this out for you. They're both translated receive. But they're not the same word. They don't mean the same thing. I don't care what the preacher's like or not. You guys ought to be ashamed of yourself. You don't find out what words mean. I'm looking at the camera. You're disgusting. That's why we don't have a big crowd here because... People want a nice, easy, slushy, mushy, oatmeal gospel. Feel like you're walking through a, a field of oatmeal. It's not true. Decomai is that word. <clears throat> it confuses people when the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God because they're foolish to him. That word receiveth is the word dekomai. Dekomai comes from the word dek, which is the word ten in the Greek. A decade is ten years. Dekomai means to reach out the ten fingers and accept an offer that's been given. The Bible says, dead men, you bunch of Baptists, cannot accept anything spiritual. He's dead. What is wrong with you guys? But you know what that's going to do? That's going to eliminate any way to Christ except predestination. He's got to put faith in your heart. And you cannot call on a God you don't believe in. And all the Baptists want to go to Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's true, but you're not going to call on him until you believe because the next verse says so. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? That's the method of salvation. Believe. But you can't believe because you're dead. Where are you going to get belief? Which is faith. <laughs> I never heard anybody say that faith was the noun and believe is the verb form. Has anybody ever heard a preacher say that? Have you ever heard a preacher say faith is the noun? P-I-S-T-I-S. -I -I believe is P-I-S-T-E-U-O. P-I-S-T is the stem of the word that has the meaning in it. I never heard a preacher say that. I used to wonder why the Bible would say believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they were saved by grace through faith. One's the verb, the other's the noun. Do you even care? Preachers don't care. You know, I can just keep going on this continually. In 1 John 3 and 7, the Bible says, now figure this out. Remember, Ergon is works of the flesh. Poema is the work of God. It says in 1 John 3 and 7, He that doeth righteousness is righteous. If you took a wild guess, what would you say that word doeth would be? <laughs> it's obvious. It's either Ergon or Poema. It's poema. It has to do with God. It's, it's a magnificent tapestry. It's a mosaic. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. You can't be doing righteousness. It's just God doing it in you. So it has to be poema. That's what it is. Then Philippians 2.13. Let me give you another word. 
that has to do with do. In Philippians 2.13, the Bible says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out is a very interesting word. It's the word. Let me erase some of this. Katagazuma. It's a construction of kata and ergon. Remember the word ergon? Ergon means to toil. Katagazuma from, comes from kata and ergon. Ergon, remember, there's that word. There's that word. Kata means either down with intensity or against. Now, you're going to have to do a lot of studying. You've got words that start with kata over 100 times in the New Testament. That's just a prefix. Katagadzimai comes from kata and ergon. And it says, work out your own salvation. The amazing thing about this work out, Paul is telling the Philippians, work out, and it is an imperative mood in the Greek. It's an imperative mood. That is a command just as much as when Jesus would say, let there be light. It's just as much a command as that. So Paul is commanding them. But the amazing thing, Paul says back in Romans 7, 18, 7, 18, he says, how to perform How to perform that which is good, I don't know how to do it. Here's the amazing thing. The word perform is katergadzomai. He said, I don't know how to perform right. Everything in me is doing wrong. He said, I live in this fleshly man. I have an outer man. Same chapter, Romans 7. He said, I do not know how to catch God's mind. Yet he commands the people at Philippi to work out or fully accomplish your salvation. I don't know how people can say works has nothing to do with salvation. You're not saved by works, but you are saved by a working faith. Faith without works is dead. People don't even understand. There's something that the old Puritans came up with, people like Martin Luther, and they came up with faith alone. Sola fide. They said, faith, all it takes is faith and that's all. Well, yeah, but wait a minute. Doesn't faith work? Doesn't faith understand? I mean, how can you... See, I disagree with Mr. Luther just saying, faith alone, soul of the day, works has nothing to do with... That's not true. Faith alone, but what does... It's like this. You put faith in the middle of a pinwheel. Faith. You put it in the middle of a pinwheel... And you say, what does faith do? Well, faith works. Or well, how does it work? It works by love. Galatians 5 and 6. Faith worketh by 
agape. Agape is walking in the commandments of God. I think that has to do with some kind of works, doesn't it? Faith worketh by love, by agape. And agape was a relationship between a king and his subjects. When they loved him, they willingly walked in these. And Galatians 5 and 6 says, faith works by love. You can't just say faith alone without anything else connected to it. What else does faith do? It is the substance of things hoped for. Substance, hypostasis. Hupo means under. Stasis means to stand. Understand. But the Bible says there's none that understandeth and there's none that seeketh after God. Man cannot conjure up faith on his own. God has to put understanding in his heart. Without these words and without knowing what they mean, what are you going to do with them? Can you just say, works does have nothing to do with faith. It has everything to do with what gets me, I've got a, this is out of, out of concordance. The Bible speaks of being obedient to the faith in Romans 1 and 5. And in Romans six sixteen, about being obedient unto righteousness. You mean you don't have to obey righteousness? Righteousness is the word dikaio sune di ik. A I O S U N E. Dikaya Osune comes from the word DK, which is the word right. Does anybody know how to do right or what right is? There's an old song, it's a Western song, and it's about the sons it was by the, sung by the sons of pioneers. And he says uh, I'm back in the saddle again, out where a friend is a friend, and where the only right is the only law is right. In the middle of the song, I think that's a great that's a great line. The only law is right, and that's what the law should be with us. And then you you find that we're commanded to be under obedience. Into obedience in 1 Corinthians 14, 34. Every thought of God is brought to obedience in the 10th chapter of 2 Corinthians. Our thoughts have to obey God. And then you get into the word obedient. Neither were they obedient to the law, talking about Israel. The Bible has got obeying God all through the Old Testament. You can't just say you're saved by grace through faith and works has never anything to do with your life. That's wrong. And the Baptists say, not of works, not of works, not of works. They sound like parrots. You guys have not read your... Look up the word obey in your concordance. See how many times it's mentioned. Jesus became obedient to death, even the death of the cross, and he is our example. So we've got to be obedient to the daily cross, death on the daily cross. I've, I just took this out of the, I took this out of the concordance. See where I've got little red markings just talking about obeying righteousness, obeying faith, obeying God. I just marked this is all obedience and obey all through here. And all those red markings are where we're to obey the truth, obey God, obey faith. How, how can you guys say that works has nothing to do with anything? You're saved unto good works. It's, it's insane what these guys are saying. Now, now you got a word that people are real confused on. <clears throat> and nobody has any earthly idea what it means. I've never... You ask some Pentecostal, some charismatic, they say, all you have to do is ask God and He'll give you whatever you want. No, that's not true. 
And faith has got so many things connected with it. You have to obey it. It's understanding. It's, it's being rebuked by God. Without knowing these words, what are people going to do? There's the word ask. And people will say, see, all you have to do is ask God and he'll give you what you want. No, he won't. This word ask is the Greek word aiteo. A-I-T-E-O. And every time you find sometimes the word aiteo is not translated ask. Sometimes aiteo is translated desire. See, if you desire something, all you have to do is ask God. No, that's not all there is to it. Ask is a conditional word. Conditional word. What is the condition? Well, I'll show you where the conditional word is. Look over here in 1 John 3. 1 John 3 and 22. Here's the condition of asking. How many times have you heard some person say, asking you shall receive, and what's have you ask in prayer believing, and you receive it? Ask in prayer believing. Ask, prayer, Believing. You see, all these words have basically the same meaning. Ask, pray, believe. <clears throat> they have to do with self-dying. That's what they have to do with. When... Matthew 21, 22 said, Whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive it. Ask whatsoever thou wilt. In Mark 6, 29. What things soever you desire. In Mark 11, 24. The word desire is the word iteo. It's not just the word ask. Iteo. It's a conditional word. It actually comes from the word A-I-T-E-M-A. -E Here's the condition. It's a form of the word itema. Itema is a word petition. It also comes from the word itia. A-I-T-I-A. A-I-T-I-A. They're all conditional words. When they come from the same word, they're all conditional. And when he says, and when the Bible says, when Pilate said of Jesus, Jesus stood before Pilate, and Pilate said, I find no fault in him. That's the word idea, fault. What, what Pilate was saying I find no legitimate reason for putting this man to death. That's what Pilate said. No lawful reason. So that means that ask is a lawful term. What is the law and the term of ask? I saw David Jeremiah. What an imbecile. What an idiot. I saw him on TV one night. He said, I got a letter and wanted to know, what does ask mean? I searched all through my library, and I just couldn't find anything. He said, ask means to ask. You're an idiot, mister. You, you didn't study the word. I, I'm going to give you the, I'm going to tell David Jeremiah, don't, don't ever come around teaching, teaching my people. I don't like David Jeremiah. He's a false teacher. He's a mush teacher. He holds hands with TBN, and he's a, 
He's a compromiser. He's got two religious names, but he's not religious himself. Look over here in 1 John. 1 John. Now, here's, this is the condition of asking. This is going to tell you how you ask and how you get what you ask. 1 John 2, 22. Whatsoever we I tell ask, we receive of him because or if, if we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Two conditions to asking. Keep commandments. What would that be equivalent to, to some word we've already used? Doing the commandments of God. My brothers and sisters are those who do the will of the Father. Keep commandments doesn't mean to do all the, do all the law. The word keep is the word T-E-R-E-O. Tereo. It means to guard against loss. No matter where you are, you're going to fight. What this word Tereo means is kind of like you're, the, you're a guard standing in front of this big locked up you got all these bars here and you're standing out in front with a rifle and you're guarding the law that's inside that safe. That safe is your heart. He's written on fleshy tables of our heart and we know the truth even if we can't do them all and we will guard against loss and we will fight for the truth of the word of God. We'll say, you, you lie preachers, you're not telling the truth and I'm guarding this against loss. And then he says, if you guard the law that's written in your heart, and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. This is the condition. This is the condition of Iteo. Everywhere you find it. Pleasing is the word Aresco. A-R-E-S-K-O. A-R-E-S-K-O. Excuse me. The best way to find out what is pleasing to God is to go over to Romans. Now, this is what's pleasing. Look for every time you find the word pleasing. One of the best definitions for pleasing is in Romans 12 and 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Wait a minute. What is a living sacrifice? A daily cross? Self-denial? Death to self? If you give your body a living sacrifice, you go out daily and tell people the truth. Christmas is pagan. Predestination is true. God does not love everybody. And you're going to be crucified for it. So you, there has to be death to self. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, hagios, pure, and you will be purified after God puts you through so much trial, fire, and tribulation to burn out that outer man. 
I, I've never heard any preacher talk about the inner and the outer man. That we have the inner, we have the inner man, which is Christ in you, and He can't sin, and the outer man can't quit sinning. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. That's the inner man. His seed remaineth him, and he cannot sin. But the outer man, the Bible says. If we say we have no sin, have present tense, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. That inner man is the one that puts us through tribulation, trial, and persecution. That's a lifetime of God's work in order to get rid of self. When you're born again, you have a whole lot of self in you. So do I. I've, I've watched God clean my life up. I mean, I'm not the man I was at 35. At not even close. All I wanted back then was fame and fortune, and I wanted to be somebody famous, and I wanted applause, and people say, you're great. I don't want that at all now. God is just about cleaned this outer man out of my life. Oh, I've got some sin, but it's not like it used to be. It's just a thin veneer of this outer man. God has put me through trials and persecution, every kind of difficult thing. That is his workmanship. That's what he's working on you and I about. His workmanship. And he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice on a daily cross. Holy, acceptable unto God. Acceptable is the word you arrestao. U A R E S T E O. It's it's you with a resco pleasing pleasing we get what we ask if we have a daily cross death to self there has to be death to the flesh you can never be asking for yourself never there has to be death to self and people come up and say whatsoever you ask pray believe and you receive it ask is conditional on death to self but so is prayer. Prosukama is death to self. Prosukama comes from pros and UK. That's the same thing as asking death to self on a daily cross. It means to toward the will of another. We pray thy will be done God. We don't pray for self. It's crazy what, if people don't know the meaning of these words, how are they going to, all they're going to do is beg people down an aisle and say, accept Christ as your Savior and pray this prayer. You're home free. No, you're not. Once you begin to believe your truth, the truth of the Bible, your trials are just beginning. It's just starting to get tough. That's what the Bible means when it says, if the righteous scarcely be saved, molus with great difficulty, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear if God makes it hard on us? That's God working in you to willing to do of his good pleasure. It's God that works in you. That word is there gone there, but it's God doing the working. I can't believe that people don't know any of these things. I find no fault in him. Every time you find the word fault, it's either Riteo or Itima or one of these words that's connected to this. It's what's wrong with the preachers and the reason they're lying. They don't have the foggiest idea what the Greek words mean. None. And how many Baptist preachers have I heard say, well, it's by grace through faith and not of works, not of works, not of works, not of works, not of works. Ah, ah. Sound like parrots. 
And they never get to the next verse. We are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to good works. If God makes you a new creature, you're going to change. But how long does it take you to change from that that inner man to take over your whole life? It takes a lifetime for him to take over everything. People don't understand. You can't get lost after you're saved. If you could get lost, it'd be the first sin that you committed that would make you lost. It doesn't wouldn't matter how many sins. You'd have to be going around. If prayer saved you and accepting Christ, you'd be getting lost all day long. Oh, Lord, you'd have to be going around saying, Oh, Lord, save me for Jesus' sake. Lord, save me for Jesus' sake. Lord, save me. I repent, I repent, I repent, I repent. Because you'd be constantly lost. You can't get lost after you're saved. I keep saying, saved is not a one-night thing. That's what Hymenaeus and Philetus preached. They preached that the resurrection was past. It was one time. Genoma. It came about one time in the past. The night you so-called got saved. And they, the Bible says that ate like a canker, a gangrenos, G-A-G-G-R-A-I-N-O-S. To tell somebody, well, once you get saved, you're saved forever, no matter what you do, what you are. But saved is the word sozo. It means to be taken from one point all the way to another point and to preserve through the whole deliverance, through all the fire and the trials and the persecution. It's, I mean, I'm just, I'm astounded at the ridiculousness. I was going to give you the word received a while ago. I didn't give you both words. There's two words for received, two common words for received. If you don't know the difference, I'm sorry, but they don't mean the same thing. That's why preachers are lying. They're too lazy to look up words. Preachers are bums. That's what they are. And I don't make any excuse for that. My father was a bum. He didn't know what anything meant. Didn't never preached to never never mentioned a Greek word in his life that I ever heard him. Not one. Received. I didn't give you this. Two words received. You got the word lambano and the word decomai. Decomai comes from deck, which is the word ten. A decade is ten years. Lambano, uh, the Bible says in, in John, the first chapter, that Jesus came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, that word received is not the word decomai. It's the word lamb. But many as received him, to them gave he the power. You remember that word? Power is the word E-X-O-U-S-I-A. He gave them the existence to become sons of God. Oh, existence. Exousia. Comes from E-X-E-S-T-I. E-I-N-A-I. Means to be or to exist. As many as took hold of him. But you can't take hold of God before you are born. There's a verse over here that really goes with that in Isaiah. Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64 and verse 7. There is none 
nobody that calleth upon thy name. This goes along with the sinner's prayer. People saying, all you got to do is pray to God and ask him to come into your heart when you can't do that when you're dead in sin. There's none that calleth upon thy name. This is talking about when he's dead, when you're dead, because the next phrase tells you that. There's none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself. You can't call on the God. Call on the Lord. Call on the Lord. And stir yourself up. Stir self. Stir up is the word U-W-R. means to wake oneself from the dead. What this is saying Kept spelling. <laughs> D A D. What this is saying, before you're before when you're dead in sin, you cannot call upon God to wake yourself up from the dead. That's what it says. It says this refutes all the sinner's prayer stuff. Because you're dead. And like I keep saying, how dead is dead? Well, it's dead. So if you're dead, how are you going to wake yourself from the dead by calling up on God when you're a dead body? You can't. If God doesn't put faith in the heart of his elect family, do you realize how much this goes along with predestination? For whom he did, for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Whom he predestined, he called, he justified and glorified. Those are all past tense verbs called justified and glorified. That means he did this from the foundation of the world. That's what God did. I'm just, I'm tired of the doctrine of the preachers. I'm going to call them what they are. You guys are lying. Look, I'm really confident in what I'm teaching. If you don't like what I'm saying, call me and tell me. And I'll call you a liar to your face. I am sick. I'm 84. I don't care what preachers think of me. I don't care what anybody in the town thinks of me. I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't really care if you shoot me. You want to burn my house down, steal my car. I don't care. I'm going to tell you the truth. I've never been so sick of preachers as I am. I've been preaching... Since 1961. And I started studying the Bible when I was 17 in 1956. You guys are just disgusting. You don't care what anything means. You say, the King James Bible was good enough for Jesus. I'm sorry, the King James Bible wasn't translated until 1611. Jesus was long gone by then. I'm just tired of this. So, this word received, lambano, you cannot take hold of his hand before he births you. You can't do that. And you cannot decomai accept. But the thing about decomai in Hebrews, Hebrews the 12th chapter. Look at Hebrews the 12th chapter. Hebrews 12. How much time do I have, Mike? 30. 30, okay. 30. Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Hebrews 12. I have people, I've got these shirts that say, God does not love everybody. And I have people say to me, well, what do you mean God doesn't love me? I say, that's what the Bible says. He loved Jacob and hated Esau before either one were born, before either one had done any good or evil. That's another doctrine that Baptist preachers hate that. Yet it's in the Bible. 
I wore a shirt today. It said predestination is true. I believe it. It's in the Bible. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ and to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. I never heard a preacher define the word adoption. Adoption, who of the C-H-U-I-O, T-H-E-S-I-A. It comes from huios, H-U-I-O-S, which is the word sons, and tithame, T-I-T-H-E-M-I, which means to place. When you go to an orphanage to adopt a child, they don't adopt you. They're not the ones that say, I want this parent. You say, I want this son. I want this daughter. They do the adopting. We're predestinated to the adoption of children. By, and people say, why would he do that? Read the rest of the verse. By Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Ephesians 1 and verse 5. Because he wants to. Well, why does he want to? Because he wants to. I don't know the want of God. I can't think like he thinks. He said, your thoughts aren't my thoughts. and Your ways aren't my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways and your ways and my thoughts and your thoughts. You can't think like God. If you think that's unfair, it would be fair if he sent everybody to hell. It's grace when he picks out some and says this one, this one, this one. But it's not many, it's few. Of all the people in the world, only a few are going to heaven. I didn't say that. People get mad when they see that on a shirt. I got one shirt that says on the front of it, most people are going to hell when they die. One lady jumped and she said, what are you talking about? What you got that on your shirt for? I said, you act like I said that, ma'am. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. Read Matthew 7, 13, and 14. I didn't say that. You mad at him. I think people are funny because they hate the Word of God. Now, I'm just, people don't know what anything means. The two words that are more puzzling than anything else with the preachers. There's two words for no. They're not the same word and they don't mean the same thing. What's the matter with you guys? Do you think these translators were perfect? Most of the translators were in the Church of England and that's nothing but a plastic Catholic church. It's a synthetic Catholic and they translated a lot of things wrong. Get you an interlinear Bible. It has the Greek on the top line. Learn the Greek alphabet and learn to read the words. It's not hard. It's, I mean, it's not hard at all. I mean, the Greek alphabet is like falling off of a log. One more time. Instead of A, B, C, D, they got A, B, G, D. This is a G. looks like a little short stubby Y. So they got A, B, G, D. And why do they have G here between B and D instead of somewhere down in the alphabet? They were here first. They can do what they want. And then they have, this is the way I divide the alphabet up. A, B, G, D, E, Z, E. This is a short E, like met, eh. This is a long E, like they. And this is a Z. The Z is not on the end of the alphabet because they were here first. This is a Z. S. O. Oh, excuse me. Not S. This is an S. S O Z O So so is the word saved. And then you have T H T H L 
I B O Galibo Narrow Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. So that's a TH. Then you got our alphabet. There's no J, no Q. So we're going to say the alphabet without J and Q. I, no J, K, L. Looks like an upside down Y. I, J, K, L, M. Looks like an upside down H. N looks like a V. This is an X. It's a Z K, S, E, E. Like X. I'll get it in a minute. Looks like a backward E is what it looks like. X, E, E, N, O, S. Kazinos, X, E, N, O, S. Kazinos is strange. Think it not strange concerning the fire trial, which is try you. X, and X is there because they were here first. O, P, R. R looks like our R. Just knock off the front leg off our R, and you got their R. S, this is an S in the middle of a word. S on the end of a word looks like our S. T, U, P, H, P, H, I, L, E, O, Phileo. One of the words, affection. C, H, C, H, R, I, S, T, O, S. And then Z, S, P, S, U, Zu K I K O S Sugikos. That's the word natural. And then an omega, which is a long O, and this is a short O over here. Ah uh, and O. It doesn't take a lot to learn that. If you want to learn how to look up these words, it's not so hard as you think. Now I'm going to give you this on no. Got two words for no. They're not the same word, no. They're not the same word. I don't care whether people like it or not. One is the word gnosko, G-I-N-O-S-K-O. That's our word, no. I know this. It's actually the same word as gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, which is the word knowledge. Or science. Science has to do with facts. It's something you learn. That's what gnosis is. That's what gnosko is. And the Lord said, whom he did foreknow. Foreknow was the word prognosco. Those are the ones he predestined to be conformed to his image. He, the ones he foreknew. But in Matthew 7, he says to those on his left hand, Depart from me that work iniquity, I never gnosco you. I never knew you. That means to know something by learning, by having an intimate relationship. When you look at Second, Second Timothy, Second Timothy, the first chapter, first chapter, Second Timothy. This is not the word gnosko. When preachers quote this. All the Baptist preachers in America quote this when they're talking about knowing Jesus. You don't know Jesus by being absolutely positively sure. Your faith is still in him. And he says here, reading the first chapter of 2 Timothy, verse 10. 
and speaking of Jesus, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath bought, brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He says, I've been preaching the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer. The, they were trying to kill the apostle Paul. He says, these things, nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. That word know is not the word gnosko, which is our common word gnosko. It's not our word. That word no is ido. It means to see or perceive. It means to see or perceive. When, when Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, Nicodemus said, we know that you're come from God. He used the word Ido. We can see by all these miracles that you do. And Jesus turned around and said, except a man be born again, he cannot see. And he used this, Jim used this, Jesus used the same word, Ido that Nicodemus has used. Nicodemus said, we know that you're come from God. And Jesus said, you cannot see this unless you're born again. So if Nicodemus was being truthful with him, he was already a believer. He was a believer. He came to him at night because he couldn't get to him during the daytime. The crowd was always around him. So, he's, so he just went to him at night and wanted to talk to him. So Nicodemus used the same word. He said, we see these miracles you do. What did Paul mean when he said, I see who I believe in? Paul was once a killer of Christians. Where do you get that, Jim? Well, let's look at it. Let's look at Acts, the ninth chapter. Acts 9. Acts 9. Acts 9, Paul is just getting started in his conversion here. This is on the Damascus Road where he's going to be converted. Verse 1. Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples. The word slaughter is the word phonos, P-H-O-N-O-S. It means murder. He was murdering Christians. He was murdering them. Breathing out slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. Went into the high priest and he said, I want to go to Damascus and pick up some of these Christians and bring them back here so we can kill them. Look over at Acts 2. I mean, not Acts 2. In Acts 8. Acts 8, it's talking about, it's talking about from chapter 7 how Saul was holding the coats of the men that were stoning Stephen in verse 1 of Acts 8, and Saul was consenting unto Stephen's death, and at that, at that time, there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem and they were all scattered abroad to the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. 
As for Saul, he made havoc. He made Lamonam evil, insult, maltreated. He made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women. The word hailing means dragging them out by their hair, grabbing them by the head, dragging them. He was killing them. See, that's why he said, I know, I see who I believe in. I've watched God change my life. You want to know about your salvation? Live a long time, go through the fire and trial and repent of your sin. Say, God, help me to get over me, that outer man. And then look here in Acts 22, 4 and 19. Acts 22. Acts 22. What Paul was saying, I can see that I'm not the man I used to be. 22, 4. 22, 4. This is Paul talking after he'd been taken by the authorities. In verse 4, and I persecuted this way, this hodos. That's the narrow way he was persecuting. He was willing to say it. I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women that were believers. That's why the apostles, when he was taken to Jerusalem by by. Barnabas to introduce to the apostles. They said, ah, ah, get him out of here. He'll kill us all. So when he said, I know whom I believe, he said, I've seen myself change from one of them to me now. He didn't say I'm positive, absolutely sure. But that word no is being an eyewitness to a change in your life. And then he says over there in verse 19 of the same chapter, chapter 22. And I said, Lord, oh, let me read the verse before. And saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I am present and beat in every synagogue, them that believed on you. I beat people. Paul was mean when he was in, when he was a Pharisee. He was just mean as a snake. It shows you what, that's why Paul never failed after he came to knowledge of Christ. Peter was just an old fisherman. He always sat around with his foot in his mouth, but Paul, he never failed. He was like Joseph of the Old Testament. Now, there's so many words in the Bible that people don't have any idea what they mean. They don't, they don't know what the Bible's even talking about because they don't know the words. If you don't know the words, you're not going to learn what they mean. There are words that have been translated wrong. It's like you've got the word diacrino. It's not exactly a mis mistranslation. Diacrino comes from dia, means the channel or the method of crino, judging. Diacrino is the opposite of crino. Crino means to judge. We're to judge righteous judgment. But when you do the judging, you're diacrino. That's the common word doubt. And it's translated over in Romans 14, about verse 18. It's also translated stagger. But when you look at this word stagger, it tells you more. 
when the Bible says, if you'll say to this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into sin, not doubt in your heart. In Mark eleven twenty three, it's hard to see what that means. It's not hard to see what it means when you see, when you look at Romans 4, it's talking about God calling things that be not. See, they don't know what calling things that be not. As though they were. Something that was not. Something that was not was something that was dead. The Bible talks about all through the Old Testament. That be not. As though they were. That God quickens, he precedes that by saying, God quickens the dead and call things that be not. Quicken the dead, quicken Z-O-O-P-O-I-E-O. -O -O -E -O. Zoom, remember the word poeo, that's something that God does. God quickens, makes beautiful, makes a, makes a mosaic alive. That's like a mosaic or a tapestry. Every time you find that word, tapestry. Zoo is, means alive. God makes alive a tapestry in our life with the fire and the trials that gets rid of the outer man. I've never heard anybody talk about the inner and the outer man. Because most people, once you get saved, all your sin's over with. No, it's not. You've got that outer man that God's got to conquer over the next 40 years of your life. And he called things that be not as though they were. That's quick. In the very next verses, talks the charismatics and the Pentecostals and the name and claim it people don't even read the next two verses. That Abraham considered not his body now dead, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. He, he didn't consider that he had no more sperm, no more seed, and Sarah didn't ovulate anymore, and she couldn't have children. And God says, you're going to have a son. He's going to bless all the world. His name's going to be Isaac. That was the resurrection that God preached to Abraham. God foreseeing that he would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel to Abraham. The gospel was that he pulled Isaac out of the dead womb of his mother, the dead loins of his father. And then he says, Abraham didn't consider his body dead, nor the deadness of Sarah's womb, but he staggered not. Staggered is the word diacrino. Same word as doubt. He staggered not through the promise of God through unbelief. Staggering, that tells you, that tells you that staggering or diacrino is unbelief. You can put unbelief everywhere else you find diacrino in the Bible. Everywhere else you, and you can find it by simply having a a one of these you can find everywhere that word diacrino is mentioned with a word study concordance you get the number out of the strongs you turn to the number in here I believe that's 1225 or something like that 12 I think it's right here I've looked at it so many times yeah, here it is, decreno. Decreno is the word discern in Matthew 16, 3. It's the word doubt in Matthew 21, 21. It's the word doubt in Matthew eleven twenty three. It's the word doubting in Acts 10, 20. It's the word contended in Acts 2 and 11 and 2. You're not going to know it's the word contended unless you look it up. It's the word difference in Acts 15 and 9. It's the word staggered in Romans 4 and 20. He staggered not 
of the promise of God through unbelief. And the word unbelief is simple. It's the word A-P-I-S-T-I-S. Pistis is the word faith. And the alpha privilege negates that word. It means no faith. So it would be no everything that faith is. No agape. Faith works by agape. No walking in the commandments of God. No understanding. Understanding. No substance. Understanding. So if, if, if Abraham did not stagger, stagger, diacrino, he didn't judge God by saying, I can't have a child. I'm 99 years old. And Sarah's 89. We can't have children. Well, yeah, you can. And it, it just people don't know what these words mean. When I was young, I didn't know what doctrine meant. Did you? I had no idea. It's real simple. Define it. Did I K. Instruction. You mean it doesn't matter what the instruction says? If you get a computer, you can just plug it in any way and put any wire anywhere? You can't do that. Instruction is everything. I heard the great scholar, Pat Boone, Heard him say on TBN one time, one man's doctrine is another man's garbage. Pat, you need to go back to your love letters in the sand, sing that, forget being a Bible teacher. You're stupid. I thought, what an idiot. One man's garbage is another man's doctrine. You're a stupid man, Pat. I hope you see this. I'm sorry it's instruction. Instruction matters. There's another word, which is didaskalia. It's the same meaning, D-I-D-A-S-K-A-L-I-A. -I -I. It means instruction. It's either the instruction or the man doing the teaching. It's all it's about. I never heard anybody define doctrine. Have you? <laughs> it's like saying you can buy some computer or you can buy... Uh, some you don't know nothing about uh, computers and just as long as you can plug it in somewhere it don't matter just put the wires wherever they'll if you can cram them in there it, it, that's what they think about doctrine all these preachers I don't like the preachers the hardest thing for me to do to is accept the fact that the Baptist preachers I was raised around had no idea what they were talking about. None. Baptist preachers don't know the truth. Pentecostal preachers to say they don't know those they're nuts. Their tongues thing. There's all these words that don't mean what people say they mean. And you know how many times I can go through this and go over and over and over it? It's like teach is the word didaktikos. It comes from the word didaktikos, the I-D-A-K-T-I-K-O-S. It's a form of the word didake, teach. You've got the word mathetes, which is the word disciple, M-A-T-H-E-T-E-S, is the word disciple. It means a learner. Well, you can't learn unless you learn the proper definition of things. We get our word mathematics from that, mathematics. And axios... Axioms are mathematical laws. I use some of them in teaching here. Axios is the Greek word axiom. Axiom. And axio, A-X-I-O-O, -O, is the word worthy. 
It's a mathematical term. How can you do things mathematically if you don't define all these words? That's why I don't like preachers. I challenge them come and I challenge them to come and correct me. Because the definitions are correct. I've spent the last 44 years just looking at all these definitions. And the preachers just don't care. You know what their problem is? They're greedy. They have a love of money. They want a big congregation. I'm out of time. They just want a big congregation. They do it for money. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Lord, I am frustrated with the preachers. I'm sick of them. I don't like what they're doing. I know you don't like what they're doing. But this is the apostasy we're in, and you've arranged it all. I'm, a, I'm supposed to thank you for it, and I do, and I'm supposed to be angry at them for what they're doing, and I am. Thank you for truth. God will give you praise for everything. We'll glorify you for everything in Christ's name. Fight our battles for us, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I didn't mean to go into all that, but I did, didn't I? That's what God wanted you to do. Huh? That's what God wanted you to do. That's what he wanted me to do. I was going to go another direction, but I just, these definitions are everything. I mean, I can't.